This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Well, welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam, and helping take our leadership to the next level, we have Dr. Richard Blackaby. Well, thank you, Sam. It's good to be with you, oh, and especially when you bring your little one-year-old uh, princess with you. Yeah, that is. Uh, she is in that stage of uh, constant attention needing, <laughs> and so she's, she is a sweet reaches little that little thing. hand up and clasps. She, she a grabs finger. your finger and drags you off where she wills you to go. And yeah, you... and there's not much changing her mind either. Like once she has. <laughs> A it's a good thing God mind. made her so cute because yeah. uh, she, she gets what she wants pretty well. Yeah, both of our girls are, are blessed to be cute because they are. Uh, I, they are certainly determined. Sam's uh, older daughter Claire actually had her first ballet class yesterday and talked yeah. about cuteness. That was over yeah, the we're, top. We're excited about that. Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's too much really for any one person to handle. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we're we're excited about that. And uh, speaking about being excited, uh, something that gets you excited is uh, history. Yeah, and uh, history we, and leadership. History you, and you, when those you, collide, you, that is it's, a, it's a usually beautiful a Churchill biography. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we started a little series on uh, just the, the leadership uh, and the lessons on, on leadership from our founding fathers. Uh, yeah, the, on in these United States of America, and uh, you have recently been on a a little tour of some of the homes and estates. And uh, one of the key takeaways, um, at least from chatting with you uh, offline and and in last week's podcast, is uh, the fact that it gets messy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we want to dial in on on one of those founding fathers, take a a little deeper dive, uh, look into his life, and that's George Washington. Yeah, and you know, I most times we've I've referenced this before, but historians often will evaluate the presidents and uh, who is the greatest and who is the worst. And you, despite what people want to try to do with recent presidents, you really have to let some time go by and see yeah. how they stack up and what they. You know, some some presidents can be quite popular when they leave office, and then you, but you evaluate and say, but what actually lasted? What, what did they do that you know we that has changed anything uh, for better or worse were were they just good in front of a camera or did they actually make things happen maybe they weren't that popular uh in public but they actually changed some things that we still feel the benefit of decades later and so uh but whenever you do see a list of presidents typically there's the the number one spot uh has two rivals for it uh they're they're basically only two presidents that people really argue about, was he the best one, the most influential one, or was it this guy? And those two people are George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times Lincoln, I think in the surveys I've seen, a lot of times he will kind of edge out Washington. I think he he perhaps kind of leads in that race, but but certainly uh, Washington's right in there. And, um, And to be honest with you, after... Uh, studying, reading another biography on Washington. I, I mentioned uh, that not long ago. Ron Chernow is uh, one of my favorite historians. Of course, yeah. he wrote a one on uh, Hamilton that the Broadway play was ultimately based on, and yeah, he's yeah. written some on Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and Ulysses Grant as well. But, um, but I think in some ways, and so in one sense, Link, uh, Lincoln addresses the biggest problem that the US ever faced and which was slavery and mm-hmm. he led during arguably the greatest crisis the US ever faced and that's the civil war uh, more american soldiers died in the civil war than all other wars combined and which that's just so like that seems so hard to fathom yeah the the, yeah. the numbers were that high yeah uh, you know, six hundred and twenty thousand soldiers. Uh, of course, there were le- there were civilians who died too, but not not to the degree of later uh, in world wars and so on. But um, but six hundred twenty thousand American soldiers. Uh, that's an awful lot of of so, and and that just counts the ones who died. There were a lot that were wounded that came back with limbs amputated from uh, you know being wounded as well. And so so Lincoln. I think certainly addresses the biggest problem and leads uh, during the the greatest crisis and um, and so I, I think that and he, and he also dies a martyr which 
never hurts your ratings when you're being evaluated later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so th- he that sort of gives him the edge. But uh, but I'll tell you, as I've read some more about Washington, I I in in one sense I feel like that he has a very good case for being the most influential. And a lot of that is because no one will ever set as many precedents as he does. Yeah, There's no one that's ever gone before. And so every solitary thing, whether it's his inauguration, whether it's him leaving office, uh, whether it's uh, giving a speech, a State of the Union address, do you write it out, do you deliver it in person? Uh, every solitary thing he does, the way he... Uh, I think he chose in his day not to go eat in other people's homes because he didn't want it to look like he was pandering the the, the presidency and so on. He sets a very high bar to start things off. He kind of sets a policy of not getting entangled in other international crises and so on and dragging the U.S. into Europe's wars and that kind of thing. And a lot of those things will, will last for a long time after him. And so uh, you can make a very good case that if it just comes... Uh, right down to who who uh, has the greatest influence on America that we still uh, experience even to this very day, uh, then a good case could be made that Washington contributed more uh, than any other president. And so, well, but, I think certainly you know being the first the first president, and you know here we are these uh, multi, you know. 200 plus years later and we still have a union i mean i feel like that that does have to count for something as yeah well. just, yeah just and the passage I, of time and i think we we lose sight now of the fact that it, there was no country in the world yeah. like uh, the united states at that time there you were really hard pressed to find a country that truly was run by a democracy that uh, uh that uh, you know the, the top power could not cling to power and just refuse to leave office or something like that or could mobilize the army um, to hold power and that kind of well, thing. Well, and just how disjointed the, you know, the existing states were. Like, it wasn't this, Yeah, it wasn't a monolith back then. Right. That's And when you realize, you know, you had states like uh, uh, Pennsylvania that was founded by Quakers, and you had a state like Maryland founded by Catholics, and you had Virginia that was run by Anglicans, uh, Rhode Island that was uh, had freedom of religion and so on, and, and very differently run states. Some that were uh, had lots of money and people, and others that were living on the edge. And and yet to pull all those together into one country that stayed together all that time was quite a feat. And so, so when you so when you see someone that has accomplished a great deal. Uh, I think sometimes our our tendency is to say, well, they were larger than life. Uh, they had some special skills, or abilities. They just seemed to be lucky, or they got it right um, all the time. And uh, and yet, when you start to dig in to look at these people, you realize, well, certainly they did do some things right as leaders. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but you also see that, like we we saw last week. Uh, Leadership and being a leader can be very messy as well. Mm-hmm. And so I want to just kind of look a little bit, particularly do a little bit deeper dive into George Washington. Um, and just to see again, I, I think to, a, and, and you know, we've said this uh, before, but sometimes when people discover that uh, a leader did something wrong, then a lot of times people can say, well, then, um, you know, I, then I, I just can't respect that person anymore. I remember... Yeah. I remember being in a little bit of a, uh, not a debate really, but a discussion with someone one time, and she was uh, criticizing me because I had cited uh, General uh, Lee as uh, as an example of leadership on a battlefield, and uh, uh, and she said, "Well, how can you cite someone that was that fought for slavery uh, for the South, uh, no matter what?" Any of those generals did, uh, Stonewall Jackson and others, you can't really cite them because they fought for a bad cause. Uh, And I had to say, uh, well, that's true, but I said, you know, in Lee's case, he didn't actually own any slaves. He was against slavery. Uh, That's not really why he was fighting, was to protect slavery. Uh, But that was where he's from, and that's all of his family was from there, and he basically chose to fight on his family side and put his family first in a sense. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, I said, but if, but if 
I said, but if you're going to be consistent about that, um, and you're not going to appreciate things that people do, you know, if they do something wrong, I said, well, then I said, how do you deal with someone like Martin Luther King Jr.? Uh, because he was, uh, unfaithful to his wife on multiple occasions. He was, it's, it's a known fact that, uh, he slept with other women and, uh, and so does that mean, I mean, if he's an adulterer, does that mean that you, you can't appreciate anything that he did either, that, yeah. that you can't appreciate any of his speeches and, and what he did for civil rights, uh, and for African American people and so on. And I said, you, if you start pushing on leaders, you're going to disqualify all of them. They're all going to be disqualified because they all have feet of clay. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you condone what they do. You don't have to agree with what they've done. Uh, you, but in, in, in my mind, uh, I, it tends to make me think in one sense, more of them, because I realize these are flawed human beings. They've yeah. got sin in their life. They've got, uh, inconsistencies, hypocrisies, fears, uh, but yet they still manage to change their world for the better. Uh, well, I think there's this mythology and, and, this this hind you know in hindsight you know these leaders tend to be sort of mythologized and all you see is the good the good things that yeah. has sort of stood the test of time and so it's it's easy to think of them especially ones in in the distant past like Washington um, all you see is this larger than life perfect you know general and president and you know, of course it was, you know, Washington did all these things cause he was Washington and, yeah. uh, you, it, it's easy to forget that, you know, he had normal struggles like everybody else. Yeah. And, and I think it, to me, I don't think we do anyone any favors by putting leaders on pedestals. We certainly see that today. Yeah. Um, better to keep them off the pedestal and realize they are flawed human beings with feet of clay too. And yet you, even flawed human beings can get it right sometimes. Yeah. And a lot of the progress of history has come because flawed human beings happen to get a home run now and then and move society and, and culture forward in some way. And so that's really, when you look at Washington, I think you can appreciate the fact that he's a, he has lots of distractions in his life, lots of things holding him back, lots of personal baggage. And I think that's one of the big ones. Uh, when I work with leaders is there are just some leaders that just cannot seem to overcome their baggage. Their baggage just seems to be constantly pulling on them, trying to drag them back into the abyss and not let them ever be successful. And, and so Washington is one of those guys that, that has a number of those kind of issues. And so let me just kind of run through some of those, uh, that I have noticed, uh, and I was reminded of uh, last week when I went to his home in Mount Vernon. Uh, one is, you know, he, He's a mystery. There, there are a lot of Christians who really want to claim Washington as one of their own. And uh, he certainly does have a lot of uh, faith, uh, it, it appears. Uh, he belongs to the Anglican Church uh, all of his adult life. He's, uh, I think he pays for like pews in two different Anglican churches. And, uh, he encourages church attendance. Um, but he also was a lifelong Mason. Uh, and, uh, even the, the, there, there was a high up Mason that spoke at his funeral and that helped say some words at the founding of the Capitol building. And, um, and that has been troublesome to some that, uh, that the, the Masonic lodge and so on was, had such a prominent role. And, uh, Chernow is a pretty good historian and he, says there's no, you can't, it's un, uh, undeniable that he was a lodge member, a Mason and proud of it. Uh, but that in his mind, it was, he, they weren't quite sure how much it was a religious thing as much as he saw them just doing a lot of public good. And he, he liked organizations that did good things for the country. Um, and he also, he doesn't really mention the name of God very often. Uh, and he doesn't, he never, uh, specifically talks about Jesus Christ as being divine, which is also something people have noticed. And he also refrained from taking communion. And that's a big kind of red light for some people. It's like, well, if you really believe, I mean, because Washington tried not to be a hypocrite. And, um, and so there's been a lot of debate. Why did he not take communion? And of course, back in that day, sometimes you would... 
go up to the front of the church to take communion from the minister. Or you, you, it was fairly obvious. You know, you were making a statement when you did that. Yeah. And uh, some people, Chernow, I think, kind of feels like um, Chernow's not. He's he's sort of on the fence. He's 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 kind of weighing the evidence and saying there's some evidence to suggest that he was maybe just a, a moralist. He might have been somewhat of a deist, like uh, Jefferson. I think uh, many of you probably have seen a famous painting done of Washington praying. I think one of those was given to my parents uh, uh, in their like house. Horse, yeah, it's by his horse, horse. It, yeah. and it's it's, it's like it portrays uh, but Valley Forge. Yeah, um, yeah. but, uh, but uh, Turnell points out that's not that was not posed for. That was a painting that was done uh, just in the painter's imagination. It's not like Washington sat there and a posture of prayer for several hours while he was being yeah. painted. And, uh, and Chernow can't, can't imagine Washington praying like that in public. He was, his, his faith was very private and that's partly why he thinks maybe he didn't take communion because he, uh, was not the kind of guy that showed his emotions and did not flaunt, uh, his personal, uh, life and values in front of the public. He felt it was more of a, a private thing. And so, uh, we're, uh, oftentimes he would use the word providence instead of God. He'd say providence has looked out for us. And I have, he said, I have no doubt that providence has a, a purpose for my life. And, and you had to kind of wonder that with Washington because there were just a number of times where uh, he should have been killed. I mean, he, he, it, in the battle with Braddock early on as a young man, he's the only officer who basically comes out alive. Uh, Everybody is shot down because back in those days, the officers all rode horses, and so you knew who the officers were. <laughs> you just yeah. if you're if you're trying to, you got one shot in your musket, you're not going to necessarily waste it on uh, a, just an infantry man. You're you're looking for someone on a horse, and uh, and after some battles, uh, Washington had six bullet holes in his hat and his jacket. Uh, that where the bullets had literally passed through his hat as people were aiming for his head and just barely missed. Uh, and it, it, where he had a number of times where horses would be killed, shot and killed right under, while he's riding it. And he'd jump off and get another horse that from someone who'd been killed and jump on his horse and carry on. And so he, he knew full well. There was one instance where fighting the British, a British soldier actually later uh, testified that he had seen uh, Washington actually got him in his sights of his of his gun, and was about to pull the trigger and kill him, but because Washington often times came right near the front, but just at that moment, Washington turned his back to the Brit, and so the, the I mean the the Brits got uh, a, a clear shot of Washington. His back is turned to him. He's got the big big man in his sights. But the Brit said, I, I, I didn't think it was decent or right to shoot a man in the back. And so if Washington had been facing him, it would have mm-hmm. been considered uh, okay to do that. But it was considered cowardly and, and devious somehow to shoot a man in the back. And so he didn't shoot. And Washington lived uh, to, to win the war and then become the president. But, um, but there were many, many times where he should have died. And, and, you know, sometimes you just wonder with history if there's not some providential care, because there, there are other leaders that would probably have done a great job, but they died of smallpox. They, they died of, you know, some other, a plague or a stray bullet or something in yeah. the battlefield. And they never, the world will never know what they would have done. But, uh, but Washington certainly had a sense that that God did have a purpose for his life, and mm. and uh, and that that fed a certain ambition in him uh, to to whatever it is that God had for him. Uh, he wanted to make sure he did it. And of course, Washington he was about eleven years old when his dad died, and that was a very devastating moment in his life because um, Washington had two stepbrothers, and those two stepbrothers uh, were children of his father. And his and his dad had sent both of them to England to go to school, and they're both older than Washington. And so uh, Washington, it was on his schedule that when he reached a certain age, I think as a teenager, he'd go to England and he would be trained and given a good education as well, like his brothers. 
But then his dad dies, and of course that changes everything financially for his family. His mother's a widow, and going to England to go to school is definitely off the table now. The family can't afford that. And so because his dad dies early, um, Washington never gets an education. And hmm. uh, and he's always he will always feel insecure and uh, um, very self conscious of that fact ever after. And of course, in the among the founding fathers, Washington is by far the least educated of the bunch. You've got some guys like Jefferson and uh, Madison and Hamilton that are just I mean their their brain power is just off the charts and and. Washington is having to deal with now. Now Washington may be the best pragmatist uh, of the bunch, but he's very aware that he doesn't have the same mental horsepower. He's not as well read. He's not mm-hmm. trained, and he was a pretty good writer. Had a pretty good grasp of uh, of the language and so on. And in that day, they're like Washington. Even his wife and his mother certainly uh, had terrible grammar, and uh, they could speak and they could kind of read and write. But they just back in those days. Uh, schooling was, you know, hit or miss for a lot of people. And, uh, and so even when Washington was going to uh, give a speech, he would often have uh, maybe Madison or, or Hamilton write it out for him because uh, he just, he felt more secure about that. And so he's, hmm. he's going to battle his insecurity his whole life uh, uh, that way. And he, he tries to read. A lot of his reading is more agriculture and things for his farm. It's more practical kind of stuff than a lot of philosophy. But, um, uh, but he, uh, he and, and so he manages to overcome a lot. And when you realize he's walking in some pretty tall cotton with these other guys, um, and yet he, he, he manages to conduct himself. And, and he, sometimes that's why he'll get criticized. Like Jefferson will criticize Washington and say, well, uh, Hamilton has just, bedeviled him and and hoodwinked him and uh, he's just not smart you know Washington's just not smart enough to yeah. know that that Hamilton is is leading him uh, by the nose here uh and Washington would get very sensitive about that that he was sometimes portrayed as not that bright you know not a bad soldier but not that bright when it comes to the you know the the the, the jungle of politics and mm-hmm. so on well I think that's a good place to uh, take a quick break This fall, we've got two opportunities to attend the Spiritual Leadership Coaching Workshop that Blackaby Ministries offers uh, each year. Normally, we just have one in the fall uh, in Jonesboro, but this year we have, in addition to the one uh, in Jonesboro, we have one in Rapid City, South Dakota. And these are for folks who work with people. Uh, You might be thinking, well, I'm not interested in coaching. That's not really something uh, I'm into But I would say that anyone who deals with people uh, can learn something from these uh, coaching workshops. It's really learning about how to ask the right questions to help move people onto God's agenda. These coaching workshops will be uh, October 23rd and 25th. That's going to be the one in Jonesboro, Georgia. And then October 12th and 14th will be the one in Rapid City, South Dakota. All the information about both of these can be found at blackabycoaching.org slash workshop. Uh, there is um, a discount for early registration, and that goes through uh, the month of August. And so if you would like to attend one of these, uh, best to sign up sooner rather than later. Well, it's always fascinating to look back at these uh, sort of giants of history and, and uh, you know, history makers in, in a lot of senses. Um, but uh, what are some other uh, just uh, insights that you've gained from uh, studying Washington, you, I know you you mentioned at the top of the podcast that you have uh, recently finished uh, Ron Chernow's book on Washington. So, what are some other? Uh, yeah, points there's lots, that stand lots out? about Washington. Uh, you know, well, couple, we could make a whole series on Washington. We could, we could. Uh, yeah, is the problem with all, all yeah. these? You know, they, they could all be their own mini yeah. series. Well, a couple other things just to point out. Washington also was uh, very fortunate in that. Uh, and, and not only Washington, but uh, but certainly Hamilton and some others, uh, Madison, where an older man would um, recognize their talent and take them under wing. And oftentimes it was a, a you know a sponsor, or someone that saw ability in a young man that would give him a break. And uh, and there were the Fairfaxes that were uh, the the kind of the 
the British ruling class of the area where Washington lived. And then the head Fairfax saw some real promise in Washington. And so he gave him some pretty lucrative opportunities that thrust him forward and basically became a father figure to him. And it's always interesting when you see some of these great, especially men of history that lost their fathers early in life, uh, that uh, many of them will find a patron, a uh, father figure that will just open doors for them that they wouldn't have had opened otherwise. And it's also interesting because Washington had a a, a very distant, uh, strained, painful relationship with his mother. His mother was a widow, a widower, a widow, but she was uh, a very strong-willed woman, um, but very self-absorbed. Uh, all she, there, there's no indication that she ever expressed any pride in the fact that her husband had won the the war against Britain, that he was the first American president. There's no, she never tells him good but job. Her son, right? Her son, yeah. yeah she. The people would come to her and say, what do you think about your son, you know, that's, that's president of the United States and first one? And she'd be like, well, he never writes, you know, never calls. Like, it was always about her. And uh, mm. and she was always complaining, and he, he never did enough. Didn't, and although he was, uh, he was the one that made sure she had enough finances and things were, she was cared for. She didn't approve of his marriage to Martha, of course, because she just basically wanted to be the woman in his life where he only just worried about her. And she boycotted their wedding. And uh, in fact, in wow. like 30 years or so, there's no record of her ever visiting Washington at Mount Vernon. And uh, That's remarkable. Yeah, there's not a lot of evidence that she was invited to come to Mount <laughs> Vernon either. But, uh, but um, wow. so he always was embarrassed uh, by the fact he was trying to be a dutiful son and to do the right thing. That was kind of George Washington's thing. But you don't have, you don't have any sense of love. Uh, in fact, when she dies... I don't think he ever even put a, a, a grave marker over his gra- her grave. He was just relieved that she was finally gone. But wow. uh, and so you know, you, and even when he was uh, like fighting the Revolutionary War, she at one point appealed to the Jer- the Virginia uh, state government for like financial support because she said her son just wasn't providing enough. And this, of course, mortified Washington. He'd never. He thought he had everything covered. She had never told him that she was short any money. She just went straight to uh, his colleagues and, <laughs> and fellow politicians. And, and so they're being told that Washington's not even caring for his, his mother. And that's, of course, for him and his reputation, that was uh, a, a extreme mortification. But uh, And so early on, it says, uh, Chernow really points out that Washington really worked to control his emotions. Uh, that he, they said he had such a mountain. Of course, he his, he lost his father early. He had a mother that never praised him, uh, never mm-hmm. cared about his career, uh, never celebrated, never said, I'm proud of you. Uh, and so he had a lot of emotions that he kind of damned up and just thought, I better, if I ever, if these ever get loose, uh, there could be an explosion here. And there were a few times during uh, the Revolutionary War when like maybe officers were fleeing or the people were uh, running from their post that he would just explode with a, a horrendous anger uh, and, and uh, people got a glimpse but most of the time he kept that carefully under wraps and and it's interesting he spent most of his adult life trying to control his emotions uh, mm. to to be careful that he didn't say things in anger that would be quoted later and uh uh, oftentimes someone would make him very angry and he would just take time before he would respond or an answer a letter, uh, and let people stew and wondering what he was thinking. Uh, and that, that actually became what, what was he did in, in a sense out of self-defense, uh, actually helped him become the man that he did. It was a perfect kind of personality type for the first president. Uh, they kind of kept his cards close to his vest, uh, didn't, lose his temper, didn't say things that he'd regret that would cause a national crisis. Uh, and, but a lot of that came because he had to deal with pain and, uh, and disappointment. And, and so he learned to be very controlled. Uh, whereas someone like Hamilton was less so Hamilton, uh, a brilliant man, but he was not Seemed more like a loose cannon. Yeah, maybe. he would be. And, it, and it was interesting is Hamilton's best days were when he worked under Washington because Washington could kind of be a bit of an anchor to Hamilton mm-hmm. when Hamilton didn't have, 
Washington there to kind of help him have some sober second thought, he would do some things that would get him in a lot of trouble, like agreeing to fight a duel, for one thing, that would cost him his life. Um, A couple other things just to say about him. Uh, He also, um, he worked hard on who he was, on his character. And a lot of leaders, I think, just assume, this is who I am, so this is what I'm going to do. But Ham, but but Washington worked on who he was going to be, and he yeah. some uh, Chernow says that he he spent a good part of his life uh, preparing to be the president. That he 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 learned to conduct himself with nobility, with uh, uh, re- respect, he, in a respectable way, and and that means that you don't just say everything you think. It doesn't mean that you jump into every fight. Um, in fact, a lot of times Washington just learned to hold his tongue. Uh, Chernow said sometimes the most eloquent things he said was nothing. And when everybody else had to get up and speak their their piece, uh, Washington would just not say anything. He he was thinking, he was paying attention. He certainly had some ideas, but uh, he would wait to be asked. A lot of people were pushing themselves forward with ambition. He'd wait to be asked. And that became very... Um, attractive to people because uh, he was an ambitious person, but he kept that ambition carefully concealed. And so Mm. uh, he wanted to make a a mark uh, on his country and for history, but uh, he he didn't, he never wanted it to look like he just pushed himself to the front of the line, that, uh, that fate, that the providence, that his people, his fellow countrymen, came to him and said, uh, George, we desperately need you. And, and then he would agree reluctantly uh, to serve as the president or the general. And, you know, he's kind of funny he's, uh, studying contrasts if you knew him well, because, for instance, when the Continental Congress is ready to rebel against Britain and, and raise an army, of course, the question is, who's going to be the general? Who's going to command the army? And there's several people who really want to do it. I think Patrick Henry, Henry and various people were ready to put themselves forward as their nation's first uh, top general. Uh, Washington doesn't raise his hand and volunteer, but but when when they're having that meeting, he shows up in his officer's uh, uniform. <laughs> so here's this <laughs> six-foot-plus man walking in in full regalia, looking every much like a general. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't say, I, I want to do it. Hmm. But it's like, well, wait a minute. There's someone in the room who looks just like a general, in the room, he's already got a uniform. Uh, maybe we should ask him. And so he had his way of being prepared and l- looking the part without necessarily having to volunteer himself. And, and maybe just the last thing to say about him is that he had, of course, his critics uh, because when you lead, you're going to have critics. And he lived in an age where there were a lot of ambitious people that all wanted the job he had. And uh, when he's a revolutionary general, there were several other generals who wanted his job. And, and, and really, to be honest, uh, Washington wasn't really the best general. He wasn't. Uh, Washington was the kind of guy that needed to, his, his mind was not rapier quick like Hamilton's or someone like that. And so Hamilton could kind of think on the fly, process things very quickly. Um, but Washington, he wanted to think about, it. he wanted he wanted to just get all the pros and cons and spend a weekend at Mount Vernon to look it all over and decide or take, give me a week or let me, you know, give me two weeks to think about this. Uh, and so that, uh, now that didn't work well in a battlefield when all of a sudden they said the British have come up behind us. Uh, we didn't know they were, th- that they would, were going to outflank us. You don't have a lot of time to mold. You, you don't have two over. weeks yeah. to like, can you give me a list of pros and cons on what would be the best thing to do here? And so that would cost him sometimes in, in a battlefield setting where yeah. you, you have to decide in real time. But as a, as a first president, when you know that you're setting precedent all the time, uh, he would often uh, ask his cabinet their opinion. He'd, he'd pull them. And even when he was a general, he had a, a council of officers that he would, uh, he would discuss with and get their opinions and uh, wouldn't really move forward typically if they were against it. And so it gave him some caution as well and uh, some wise counsel most of the time. But, um, but so, you know, that kind of thinking process uh, worked well if you had the time. If you don't have the time, then that's what would cost him. And a, a lot of his battlefield mistakes typically happen because 
uh, he, he, he couldn't think clearly and decisively just on the spot. But, mm. uh, but just to say that the, he did have some people that uh, criticized him and tried to find ways to put him in a bad light, to try to go to Congress and let them know how bad of a general uh, Washington was and uh, to try to s- sort of slight him when they could. Uh, and uh, Chernow says, though, that, that he had at one point about three different officers who were all trying to somehow uh, one-up Washington. But what he concluded was that it, it wasn't his military genius that necessarily set him apart. It was his character, Chernow says. He, hmm. When you compared his, ter- his character with his critics' characters, they all seem petty in comparison. They seem vain, uh, personally ambitious, whereas Washington appeared much more to be noble. Uh, he appeared to be someone that was willing to put uh, his country's interests before his own. A lot of these uh, military officers, they, they were all looking for fame. They were all wanting to yeah. uh, become famous and, uh, and be celebrated by their country, uh, whereas Washington, uh, I think, definitely felt like he was doing what was best for the country. And, uh, and that showed, and it was because he had a character that, not that he didn't have ambition, not that he didn't care about his mark in history, but uh, he, uh, he had a way of controlling that so that uh, he, he was not being driven, and certainly didn't appear to be driven by just vanity and pride and, uh, and, uh, and his own pursuit of riches. And of course, he also, uh, when he was leading the, the uh, Revolutionary Army for six years, uh, he declined to be paid, and he said, "I don't want it to ever appear that I uh, just served my country for money." He mm. said, "I want it to be clear I served it because I'm a patriot and believe in in its cause and so on." And so he let them pay his expenses, but not any salary, and that almost led to his ruin because for six years he was not at Mount Vernon running things, and when he came back, he didn't have. Uh, a bunch of back pay to use to repair things. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think when you look at what he did, he, there's lots of flaws and there's lots of things that he uh, wrestled with that, uh, you know, we look at now and say, well, th- th- he could have done that better and that wasn't very good. Um, but considering his context and considering that there was no precedent for what he did, um, mm. he probably was the kind of self-controlled, a uh, person that um, took his time to think uh, before acting that I think is one of the reasons why even to this day, uh, many of the precedents he set were still following even hundreds of years later. Um, well, fascinating life. And we'll leave links to Turnell's book uh, that you've recently read in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackv.org.